All right, so why don't we um, kind of talk for a quick second as you're getting set up. Uh, tonight we have Jeff Copeland, who is a professor at the University of Northern Iowa, uh, and he has written and or edited over 30 books, which is a feat in itself just to write one single book. So congratulations to you for that. Um, and he is here today to talk about his newest book, which we have in the museum's library, if anyone would like a copy, about Lieutenant Elsie Ott's top secret mission, and she is the one behind Medivac. So Jeff, if you wanna take over, uh, we'd love to hear everything you have to say. And you're muted. A little bit of a computer. Here we go. Now you're unmuted. All right. I apologize to everyone. We had a little bit of a computer issue, but I think we're up and running now. All right. I first want to thank Megan for getting this organized tonight. She has been absolutely wonderful to work with on this. She is one of the true treasures of the Yankee Air Museum. So how about a round of applause, everybody, for Megan? Okay, so second of all, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me into your home this evening. I know a Zoom session like this is a little bit unusual. I wish we could all be together. I had actually acquired enough balsa airplanes for all of us to have a contest to see who could fly one the farthest. And maybe we'll get to do that in the spring if I get to come up there. All right, if there are any questions as we go along, and I hope there would be, please ask them through the chat or raise a hand. Uh, Megan has agreed to help monitor that so that um, questions can be a part of the discussion. Usually when we're face-to-face, -face, I don't let people leave unless they all ask a question. So tonight, please do that through the chat or raise your hand part of it too. All right, and then for those of you who have purchased the book and those of you who are gonna purchase the book, if you would like to have me sign it, I can do it in a very different way now. I have book plates so that I would individually sign those for you and then I will mail them to you so you can put them inside the book. So if you're interested in that, let Megan know and we'll see that it happens. Okay, one other thing here real quick before we start. I have to tell you as we begin that writing this book is a great irony on several levels. The first of which is this, if you ever see me in front of you in line at the airport, do yourselves a big favor and take the bus. Honestly, here's the reason why. And my family will back this up. All of this is absolutely the truth, so help me. I have been on an airplane that has caught fire twice. Once they had a Circle Lake poncha train outside of New Orleans in case we exploded, they didn't want us doing it over the city. I've been on an airplane that has been struck by lightning twice. One time it knocked out the navigation system and totally fried it. So they scrambled military jets to get us to the next airport so we could land in a sea of foam. That was really quite an experience. Another time, so help me, I was in a prop plane. We landed in Greensboro, North Carolina, but not before we hit a cow that had wandered on the runway and we were in a prop plane. So it was instant hamburger everywhere. I'm not making this up. I'm not making it up. Another time a woman died on the plane and we had to land in Greenland and we were all held on the plane until they determined she actually died of natural causes and one of us hadn't done her in. Another time landing in San Francisco, a tire blew out about three quarters of the way down the runway and we spun several times into the grass. And these are only the tip of the iceberg. I kid you not, just the tip of the iceberg. So for me to write a book about a pioneering flight and things dealing with aviation is really kind of remarkable in and of itself. But I have to tell you, I've loved writing this book and I love this story. One other thing before we begin, I write what's called literary nonfiction. That means every event, major event in the story is actually true and based on historical record. I take the events and I put them into the voices and actions of the characters so that they read like novels. But everything that happened to Lieutenant Ott in this story is actually true and based on fact. 
I was able to get the flight log from this flight. I was able to interview all kinds of people involved in this journey. So everything is as it should be. Everything is the way it is. Okay, so to begin tonight, I thought it'd be good if we did a quick quiz related to the World War II era. All right, so here we go with the quiz. Now, if we were together, I'd have you raise your hands and everything else, but I'm gonna put you on the honor system here and we'll see how you do. All right, here's our first question. Which of the following is the air medal? So you take a look. Type your answers in the chat would probably be the easiest. Okay, so left, center, or right? Here we go. It is the center. That is the air medal. And the reason this is up here is it plays a prominent role in our story for this evening. So this is the air medal. All right, number two, which is the uniform Elsie Ott wore on her flight, her mission in 1943? Left, center, or right? What was the standard uniform for her? Take a look. Not that one, not that one, this one. This was the standard uniform. And this is a good time to pause because if the Yankee Air Museum will take it, I have this exact uniform right here. Um, this was actually used by one of Lieutenant Ott's best friends during World War II. And if you would like this for display at the museum, I would gladly send it to you. Yes, of course, we would love to have that. Okay. And it does meeting. have the flight wings, the flight wings on both sides too. And that plays a part of our story as well. So I will send that out to you next week. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, now, which of these is a C-47? And I understand the Yankee Air Museum has a really nice one. Left, center, or right? There we go. Now here is the bonus question. What was the nickname of the C-47 during World War II? Goonie bird, ruptured duck, or the screaming eagle? The Goonie bird. And the reason had to do with the way it took off, the way it landed, and the overall structure of it too. But I love that, I love that picture. All right, now this plays a prominent role in our story as well. What is this? This is at the rear of a C-47. Is this a medical storage compartment? Is this the aircraft trash compactor? Or is this a C-47 relief hole? Now, what do you think? Here we go. This is the relief hole used by men on the C-47, which proved to be quite a challenge for women traveling on a C-47. But as you'll see in our story, Elsie Ott had a lot to do with making some very important changes in transportation as well. All right, we're getting toward the end of our quiz here. Which German commander gave orders not to shoot down non-combat planes during the North African campaign? And this is important because if this hadn't been the case, we wouldn't be talking about this story tonight. So was that Erwin Rommel, Carl Donitz, or Albert Kesselring? It was Rommel, the Desert Fox. And he definitely ordered non-combat planes be allowed to continue. All right, in 1943, how long did a typical trip take from Karachi, India, where Lieutenant Ott was stationed? to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, DC. Now this is during World War II. So what would you guess? Three and a half months, nine weeks, four weeks. All right, here we go. Actually, it was three and a half months, three and a half months, three and a half months by ship, by Jeep, by truck, by train, three and a half months. All right, how many flights today go to the US from the US to Karachi, India? I'm afraid this is a trick question. Zero, because Karachi is now part of Pakistan. And the reason I put this in here is in doing my research, I always take about a year to do the background research for my stories, just to make sure I have things like this accurate. All the geography involved in the story is, is true. 
and not just because of the flight log, but I had to research to make sure that country names had not changed dramatically. All right, so let's get right to the story itself. This story absolutely captivated me right from the get-go. And here's the reason why. Lieutenant El Sayad really was an unwitting pawn in a top secret mission, and this is how it unfolded. Here was the problem. In the China, Burma, India theater, the CBI theater, too many soldiers who required specialized care for their wounds were dying because they couldn't get to the medical attention in time. This was a very serious problem because the roads there were horrifying. They were bad, made worse by combat. The jungle they had to go through, the terrain, everything was against them in getting people transported for help if they use trucks, if they use Jeeps, if they use six spies, things like that. So enter this person, Major General David N. Grant, the Army Air Surgeon. He decides that he is going to experiment. And what he's going to do is he thinks, well, if we could actually use air transport, this would probably save a lot of li lives. Now, there were some precedent for this, and this is it. You're looking at it right here. Believe it or not, during the American Civil War, balloons were used a few times to try to transport casualties, but it was a dismal failure, but at least the attempt had been made. Then some years later, during the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s, they tried using balloons again. Again, it wasn't a great success because balloons can easily be shot down and they don't travel very quickly, even by wind current. So that was a failure. We get to World War I, look at the picture there. That's a plane called a Jenny. I'm sure most of you know about the Jenny. Well, the fact is it was experimented with quite a bit of putting wounded soldiers behind the pilot, cram them in there, which really wasn't that good. And at times, are you ready for this? They actually strapped some of the wounded to the wings. Well, I'm telling you what, folks, if the wounds didn't kill them, I bet the, just the thought of that air flight probably did many of them. That was not a good thing. And then I have hey, to Jeff, say, yes. I'm sorry, your slide, I believe, is frozen on uh, your last question um, and haven't seen the last few. Okay, so where are we here? Are you on the proposal? Uh, we're on the how many flights to Karachi, India. Okay, I am. Okay, you're on this one. Okay, you should be on this one. It's... Sorry, everyone. Um, what if you are stop we... presenting for a moment and then go back in? Okay, I think I'll try that. Let me jump back out. Okay, and then let me jump back in. All right, are you seeing the quiz right there? Um, well, nothing changed on my end. Okay, nothing changed. Okay, I'm gonna go out again. Well, it's funny that it just stopped like that. Okay. Okay, are you seeing the slide with the uniforms? Yes. Okay, so now let me go to this. All right, now does it say quiz? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna run it back up again. I have no idea what happened there. Sometimes it's a little finicky. All right, so let me jump up here. I'm sorry, we have to jump up through this. All right, so now, now do you see the picture of the airplanes and the balloons? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Again, I apologize, folks, I have no idea. All right, so here's the Jenny at the top right there on the screen. That's where they strapped some of the people to the wings. But what I was um, going to say was we weren't the first to do this during World War II. In the early stages of the war, especially in the North Africa campaign, the Germans actually were first at putting wounded soldiers on planes to take them to get medical assistance but they did not send along any medical personnel. They might as well have been logs or pieces of firewood. They loaded them aboard like cargo. They flew them there. Their survival rate really was not good. It really was not good. 
the General Grant decided, you know what, if we had special squadrons and special people, special personnel to help with the transport of the wounded, this would make a huge difference. All right, however, we had a little bit of a problem here. Our Army Surgeon General opposed the evacuation here, General McGee. Now, can you see this slide? Is everything looking okay? Yes, we're good. He felt that it was important not to take medical personnel away from the ground support, and there just weren't enough bodies to go around. So what General Grant decided to do is he decided to do an experiment. And what he decided to do was use a nurse first so that he could prove this would work. And what he decided to do was a 15 stop journey from Karachi, India, which is the dot on the far right of the chart and map you're looking at all the way over to the United States to Walter Reed Hospital, 15 different stops on the journey. And it started in Karachi, India, went all across North Africa, went through the northern tip of South America, up into Florida, and then up to Walter Reed Hospital. And he said he wanted this done in one week. Now remember, normally it took three and a half months to get a soldier from Karachi to Walter Reed. He was gonna do it in a week because he said, unless we do a very dramatic presentation here and a very dramatic proof that this can be done, nobody's gonna listen. It's gonna get buried with all the other plans. So he decided to enlist the aid of Lieutenant Elsie Ott but she had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. She was called into her commanding officer early in the morning, told what she was gonna be doing and said, you have less than 24 hours to get ready for this journey. And oh, by the way, you're gonna take six wounded soldiers from here all the way to Walter Reed. And oh, by the way, you're gonna do it in one week. Now, here's the way it unfolded, seriously. The brass decided if the plan actually worked, they would take the credit for it. If it failed, they would simply blame the nurse. Seriously. So she had no idea, though. She had no idea. She just knew she had 24 hours to get ready for this flight. All right. So they decided for the first leg of the journey, all the way over to the Atlantic Ocean, they would use a C-47. They had one that had been gutted and was ready to go to, you know, so they could take the wounded soldiers on board. So that was to be the mode of transport for the first part of the journey. All right, it's not a roomy plane. For those of you who have been on one before, you know this. Um, I went to this one. This is at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. They were in the process of renovating it. And I got to sit in the cockpit and walk back and forth in the plane. And I visited several other C-47s as well. But I'm not much shorter than five foot nine. I'm not a tall person. Look at my head in here. It's practically hitting the top of the plane. So there were some space issues in using the Goonie Bird, but that's what they had to use. All right, she had never been on an airplane before. Seriously, she had never flown before. And suddenly she's told, all right, you're gonna fly in a week from here to Walter Reed Hospital. So she gets advice from the person in charge of all the nurses there. And basically the advice is this, what I mean is a lot of these floating coffins we have in the air come crashing down. But as I said, you can't worry about that. If your plane does hit the ground, the odds are you'll almost certainly be dead. That's what I mean. So when it's your turn to fly, just climb on in and relax. No use worrying. That was Nurse Rose McCall, who was basically in charge of all the nurses in Karachi. So this didn't exactly instill any great confidence in her. She gets on a plane thinking, what am I getting myself into? But she was under direct orders to make sure the patients got there. 
again, not designed for women. Um, there were problems in this area and many other areas as well. But again, stay tuned because she was a major agent of change. Now, C-47 also not designed for combat, had no defenses on the plane. And because the North African campaign was still going on, although it was winding down, German Messerschmitts were still everywhere along their path once they got into North Africa. Then the real challenge, the patients. Who were they going to take all the way back to Walter Reed? Here's what they said. First, we'll take patients who need long-term care, those we can and shouldn't deal with over here. We want them to be ill, but not too ill. Plus, it, wouldn't, it would be good to show a range of afflictions to demonstrate we can handle all sorts of issues. I'd like some litter bound and some ambulatory. The bottom line is we're going to stack the deck and try to go with those who have the greatest chance of getting there alive. We look pretty bad if we lost some. And this is actually from a document that I was able to get related to those who set up the mission. So they actually said this. Now, in terms of the patients that they got, here's what they did. And these are real people. And it says in here, guess how I got the information? Please, somebody at the end ask me how I got this information. These are the actual people who went. Lieutenant Jerome Collins, recent onset chronic poliomyelitis with paralysis in his lower extremities and left arm. Andrew Montague, paralyzed below the waist as a result of a lumbar vertebra fracture. Um, basically, they ran over a mine on the Burma Road. Captain C. Goldman, early active tuberculosis, um, producing a bloody cough, chest pains, and chills. Private Scalini, glaucoma in both eyes, interocular pressure of 60, which means they were constantly worried that the altitude and the pressure would cause his eyes to explode. Corporal Ed Ernst, battle fatigue, manic depressive, but he was nonviolent. He, uh, he was in need of some serious care. Sergeant Sam Ragazzi, who actually helped her care for the patients, had arthritis so severe, sometimes he couldn't even move his arms. I mean, he was that bad, but he was very instrumental in helping her get back. Now, in terms of supplies she took along the way, she was told you have 24 hours to get ready, but we're really not gonna send a lot of medical supplies with you. We can't do it, we can't spare them. So you're gonna have to scrounge along the way. Now, remember they set up multiple stops already on the journey and most of those had a hospital run by the allies. So they told her, be a scrounger steal if you have to, although she called that improvising. But she did have mass quantities of aspirin. And seriously, she actually ground up a lot of the aspirin, put it in little containers. And when the soldiers had various complaints, she would give them some and call it something else. Um, one had altitude sickness. And she said, well, here, I have some al altitude sickness medicine. And it was really the aspirin. Another one had severe pain, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the way he was put into one of the berths in the plane. So she gave him some aspirin and said, these are very special pain granules. They will help you out. So she did what she did and it turned out to be an amazing experience because she was so creative in using aspirin. All right, trouble along the way. Are you ready for this? Remember, this was an experiment, top secret. It was also the first time she had flown, and that's a picture of Elsie there in a cargo area, but this is after her initial mission. So here's what she encountered along the way. All of these are true and based on fact, and I won't ruin the book for you by telling you this, because the circumstances surrounding all of them are absolutely phenomenal. All right, now this of course is not a C-47. I couldn't find a picture of one of those that was on fire, thank goodness. But when they were in Aden, Saudi Arabia, one of the first stops on the journey, their plane caught fire. If she had known me, she probably would have been looking around to see if I was on board because this, this has happened to me. So yes, one of our first times out, the plane catches fire. 
for a new flyer. This is good, right? In Khartoum and Egyptian Sudan, they bring, after they land, they bring their patients to the local hospital for care before they can take off again the next morning. A guerrilla group in the area bombs the hospital and Elsie is buried in the rubble with several other individuals. Well, she's not actually buried, she's trapped in there and several of the others are buried. So this is right out of the chute as well. Next, the plane is actually fired on by German Messerschmitt and the plane does have the bullet holes to prove it. So she's under combat as well. When they land in Kano in the Nigerian Sudan, they are fired on by snipers when they're at a British hospital there. And then another guerrilla group steals the wheels off the airplane at night when it was left unguarded because of the snipers. So all of this is happening to Lieutenant Ott on her very first journey on an airplane. When they get to Accra, Ghana, this is right before they have to go across the Atlantic Ocean. Halfway across the Atlantic was Ascension Island that was used by the Allies for trips to and from in that part of Europe. <clears throat> I mean, um, in that part of the journey. So what they did is they, <clears throat> excuse me, they switched over to a converted B-24. The Bombay area had been fixed up so that the patients could be put down in there. So they say goodbye to the C-47, they get aboard the B-24 and they continue with the rest of the journey. More issues are ahead. First of all, the B-24 can fly a lot higher than the C-47 and when it does, LC suffers from extreme altitude sickness. So she becomes a patient herself for a short period of time, but she is tough. This woman is tough. She shrugs it off as best she can. She realizes her duty is to her patients. She gets back on board and they continue. They get to Florida. They get to Morrison Air Force Base. The regular commanding officer is gone. A civilian is in charge, believe it or not. He decides he's not going to let Elsie's patients go on. He wants to keep them there at the hospital. So what happens? You want to know what happens? Well, you'll sort of have to read the book. I'm not going to run it for you. But let's say Lieutenant Ott and a couple of her friends did indeed find another plane to use to get to Walter Reed Hospital. But I want you to read the book to find out how that happened. <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle of all this, she manages to overcome everything and she also falls in love. And I'm not making this up, it's a true story. It's a true story, folks. So we have all of that as a background. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of the book on purpose. I don't wanna run that for you, but I do want you to see what the major results were of her successful mission because, and this won't ruin the story at all, she does get everybody alive and in good shape to Walter Reed Hospital. And when that happens, here's what takes place. The air evacuation nurse program is instituted immediately because General Grant was able to say, I told you so. I told you we can do this with wounded soldiers with varying degrees of wounds. So they start the AeroVac nurse program, also the cadet nurse program at Bowman Field in Kentucky. In the first class is Lieutenant Ott. If you look at the picture, middle row, third from the right, that is Lieutenant Ott beaming and smiling. And part of the reason is they actually used her logbook and her flight book and her journal is one of the main textbooks for that course and used what she did with each one of the patients as discussion points and to decide what kind of medical supplies should be taken on future airplanes when this is done. All right, so that's the first thing. All right, second thing, because of her accomplishment, Lieutenant Elsie Ott is the first woman to be awarded the Army Air Medal. Yes, that is true. 
It is in a display case at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Museum outside of Dayton, Ohio. So if you're ever in that area and want to stop, you can, you can take a look at it. She is also promoted to the rank of captain for her pioneering work. All right, next, after this and after her promotion, promotion, she is offered the opportunity to stay in the States, but she turned it down. She wanted to go back to Karachi as one of the new air evacuation nurse officials. There she joined the 803rd MAES, the Medical Air Evacuation Squadron, and through her leadership, it's estimated that she helped save literally thousands of lives in the CBI theater. She was also instrumental in changing uniforms for the nurses. Because of her insistence, after this, the flight nurses were allowed to wear pants. Yes, finally. And she was very, very proud of that. And others were very appreciative. She also helped change plane design, no more relief hole for women. Things for creature comforts were altered on airplanes henceforth in order to make it fair for all and an appropriate ride for all. She also fought very hard for the rights of women in the military, asking that they be involved more in decision making. She was very successful in that and also served on a couple of dozen commissions for the rest of the war and beyond. All right, so get this. This is incredible. I could not believe this when I first saw the figures, but they're true. Eventually, 30 medical air, eva air evacuation squadrons, all supported by the newly trained air evac nurses, served in World War II. And get ready for this. After Elsie's efforts, over 1,172,000 patients were transported by air during the conflict. Of that number, only 46 died in flight. Seriously, 46 out of over a million patients. So General David Grant was correct, but Elsie Ott also proved that using flight nurses instead of taking the doctors from the ground and putting them in putting them in planes was also a very good use of personnel. All right, also based on her flight and her experiences, she was also involved in the development and design of the Nightingale, the C-9 air ambulance. It was actually the first aircraft for military specifically designed for the transport of the ill and the wounded. Now there's Elsie in the picture wearing pink she was invited to the christening and did the christening of the Nightingale, which took place during the Vietnam War at Scott Air Force Base right outside St. Louis. She said that was one of the more proud moments of her life and was glad to lend a hand. All right, now here's the real legacy here. Today, every time we see a helicopter or a plane transporting someone who needs medical care, we should honestly thank Lieutenant Elsie Ott. It was her pioneering work that made this possible. Most of us know someone who has needed assistance of this type or know someone who had a relative or a loved one who needed it. Well, basically, thank you, Elsie. She was quite a remarkable woman. All right, now at this point, um, I'm going to be quiet here. I'm, I'm going to try to jump off of this if I can't. Otherwise, I just keep talking. You can ask my family. I just keep talking. But I am going to try to get this off the screen. If I can do it. OK, and I'm back. All right, so can we please have some questions? Ask, speak. Uh, and if you can, it's probably easiest if you just put your questions in the chat, and we will uh, wait for those to come in. Uh, in the meantime, I do want to mention again, we do have his book in the gift shop if you want to stop by the museum to get them, but they are also available in other bookstores. Um, yep, there it is. <laughs> um, and again, I'd be honored to sign a book plate and send it to you as well if you'd, if you'd like me to do that. Uh, while we're waiting, I actually want to ask more about that uniform, about uh, where you got it, who, who it belongs to, if you can tell us a little bit more about that. 
I, I, yes, I'd be glad to. Um, when I did the research for this book, I was amazed. If, well, I shouldn't have been amazed, but I was by how giving, how loving, how generally into all of this, all the people were that I visited with. I was able to visit with quite a few of the flight nurses from World War II. Many of you probably know that there's a wonderful organization. It's a national organization called the Legend of Flight Nurses. And through that group, I was able to contact so many who had served with Lieutenant Ott. So through my contacts made through that, I was able to find individuals who gave me quite a few items. Um, I've got a couple here. Give me just a second. I'm in my, I'm in my study at home, but um, so many gave me patches. I mean, it was, that was, it was almost like every place I went, somebody gave me one of their patches. Another one of the women I interviewed was also awarded the Army Air Medal, and she gave this to me saying, I would like to have you give it to a museum. So again, would you like to have this for the Yankee Air Museum? Oh, you know, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to send that to you as well. And then several of the others also gave me their um, flight pins after they became part of the nurse corps. So I, I'll be glad to send that to you as well. So it was through meeting these people that I was able to acquire all kinds of things. And I am, I am also in the authors in the schools program nationally. So my plan was to go into the schools and share a lot of this with the younger people, but then the pandemic hit. So I would rather go to a museum um, now where a lot of school kids will show up and others as well. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, let's see here. Fred asked, what did Elsie do um, her, her life after military service? Um, after military service, she decided that she wanted to stay in the medical field. So she did serve as a nurse after the war. And what she really wanted to do was to work with returning veterans. There were a lot of returning veterans that she felt weren't being given the proper care once they got out of the military hospitals. So she actually moved to Illinois. And while she was living in a small town in Illinois, she started a program to help get veterans the kind of help that they needed. So that's pretty much what she devoted the rest of her life to. And how long did she serve before uh, retiring? She served from slightly before the war started. Um, she knew she wanted to serve as a nurse in the military. And then after the war ended, it really wasn't that long before um, her discharge, simply because she wanted to go out and do things for the returning soldiers. So it really wasn't that long after okay. on a mission. She really, really in her heart and soul believed that not enough attention and care was being given to those returning home. Uh, on the first flight, did they make it in one week? Yes. Well, okay, I should say you'll have to read the book to find out, <laughs> but spoiler alert, yes, they do. But it's not running the story for you because how they did it in a week is incredible. Now I have the flight log. So I got to see all of the stops they made, how long it took them at each stop and so on and so forth. How they did it, I think is just absolutely amazing. It's phenomenal. I can't believe they pulled this off. But she was so dedicated to doing this and was able to convince others to help so that they were able to do it. Now, when I got to Florida, when I got to Morrison Field, I'm not gonna say any laws were broken here or any rules of the military were violated, but let's just say laws were broken and military rules were violated. So a lot of creativity was involved getting the last leg of the journey. Um, now I'm not gonna say any more about that for those who haven't read the book, but I think you'll be shocked to see how she finally got this concluded. It's awesome. Uh, Lori wants to know if she married the co-captain. Um, I think I'm just going to say, I know you're going to hate this. You'll have to read the book to find out because that plays a big part into her life. And um, I'm a romantic at heart. 
I am, and I'm just gonna say, I don't wanna run this for you. I want you to have the same exhilaration and joy and all the other feelings I had as I uncovered her life. So that's a teaser for you. Okay. If you wanna know, read the book. Uh, my own personal question is, are you still flying? Um, yes, and, and if you, well, okay, now during the pandemic, I did not. Um, Actually, I was set up for a book tour of England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, 12 cities in this country. This book came out March 15th, one day before every bookstore in the world virtually closed up. So I had to cancel the entire book tour. My relatives will not fly with me anymore. So I wouldn't have gotten anybody in my family to go with me on these trips. And I'm not making this up. Even people from my university, if we go to a conference or something like that, they check which flight I'm on and they take a different one. I'm serious. They do. They I'm have a reputation. <laughs> I know. I know. And it's terrible. But, you know, I look at it this way. I'm a person of faith. And I believe the good Lord is not going to torture me on an airplane for 30 years and then kill me. <laughs> so even if it crashes, I'll probably crawl out of the rubble, you know. So anyway. Well, I hope you never yeah. get to that point. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I've been in everything except a blow up crash. I've assumed the position, the crash position six times on airplanes, six times. Oh, gosh. I know. I will make sure, no, <laughs> nothing against you. I'll make sure not to fly with you. <laughs> I know you shouldn't. I was even arrested. Well, I wasn't arrested. I was detained in England right before the pandemic because they thought I was a drug lord from South America. When they scanned my passport, I looked like this guy. In my last two ports of call in my passport were El Salvador and Costa Rica, where the guy had been known to be selling his, his drugs. So I had to talk my way out of that one. Now, look at me. Do I look like a drug lord? But anyway, it's just my luck flying. It just, yeah. All right. Uh, I'll shut um, up. What questions? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any other questions come in, um, but I do want to say thank you for tonight and for taking the time. Um, I know we were supposed to have you here last year, like you said, and it just didn't work out, but we really appreciate you taking the time to do a Zoom webinar with us. And and uh, I, I personally, I have the book. I haven't read it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. And, and you know what there is? I'm not going to write it, but there is a sequel to this story, what she did later. And if next year you could have me to the museum, I'd be honored to come up and talk about that um, free, no charge, part of my offers in the schools thing. And then I will bring all those balsa wood airplanes I bought for everybody. And maybe Perfect. we can have our contest. I like it. Let's plan it. We'll do it. <laughs> all right. We'll it. And I want to thank all of you for joining in, inviting me into your homes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. Have a good night, everyone.